welcome, everybody, welcome. I'm so excited to see you here because you are the future influencers, elected officials, maybe you're existing elected officials, but you're the people who we really want to see in office and see it in the future. And so this is the first of a series of three seminars. And the next two, one is gonna be um, two weeks from now on October 12th. This one is about the foundation, how to decide if you're gonna fund, uh, if gonna decide if you're gonna run, and all the techniques for, about fundraising and becoming a viable candidate, which we're gonna hear from Dottie Lemieux, who is a pro at this. She has Green Dog Campaigns, and that is her company, and so you're gonna hear from people who are either you know, our total professionals. And, and Lori, Lori, are you here? Is Lori here yet? Okay, so Lori Earp is also a professional fundraiser and does a wonderful job of telling you how to raise friends and how to raise funds and um, will give you a real detailed idea of what this all takes. So I want to start by saying this is the first of three. If you signed up for all three, the last one is October 26th. That one will have a graduation ceremony, and if you're all, you know, if you see, go to all three, you will get a certificate of accomplishment and graduation. We will have elected officials there to help present these to you. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, the other benefits of being here and run and considering or and or running for office is that you connect with campaign professionals in this group, elected officials. There are elected officials here potential fundraisers, supporters, and people who will be instrumental parts of your campaign or you'll be instrumental parts of their campaign. And just basically, my theory is, even if you run and lose, you never lose. Because you're doing public service in the first place. And what you gain is name recognition, a place in the community, and so you have all kinds of potential for future runs or helping other people that you like and respect get into office. So anyway, I want to, um, we're going to introduce each other to each other. We'll go around the room, but first I want to say uh, thank yous to, first of all, Christina Waldeck and Barbara Matas for setting this up and making this wonderful dinner. I want to thank Cindy, our photographer, who is the one with the camera, obviously. <laughs> thank you, Cindy. Um, and to Vida Flores, where are you Vida? Okay, who is going to take videotape all of this so that we will post it on our website so if you miss something you can go back and review it. And to Dottie and Lori, our speakers are our treasured speakers because they're pros. And to Miranda for picking up the food. Thank you so much. Okay, so now what I think I would like to do is have us all go around the room and introduce ourselves and just say why you think, why, what you're looking for. Why are you here? Okay, and so can we start here? Sure. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Crystal Martinez and I am here because I am appointed to the College of Marin Board of Trustees and I'd like to remain there so I'm running in November of 2024. Woo! <laughs> Considering running, huh? Oh, yes. oh, oh, you are. Okay, I'm sorry because I'm behind you. I can't do So. Okay, am I next? Oh, yes. <coughs> Wendy Freifeld with Marin Women's Pack. Thanks, Wendy. Hi, everyone. I'm Nicole Gardner. I ran for City Council in Novato uh, 2021, 2022, last year. Um, you guys actually endorsed my campaign, oh, the firefighters. Yeah. 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 And um, I'm planning on running again, so I'm just here to sharpen my skills. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Summer Cassell. Um, I'm hoping to help Crystal a little bit with her campaign, so we're very excited about that. And I just want to learn a little bit more about campaigns myself, so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. 
Hi everyone, I'm Laurel Druk. I'm the Vice President of MWPAC and mm -hmm. just here to support everyone and also I've run campaigns before so always good to sharpen skills and learn more. Um, I'm Miranda Miller. Uh, I'm new to Women's PAC and I'm really excited to be here because I'm a curious seeker and like Summer I want to just learn more about campaigns. So. I'm Barbara, I'm a part of uh, Marin Women's Pack, and I'm just glad to see everybody. <laughs> I'm Dottie Lemieux, I'm one of the speakers tonight. <laughs> I'm Skylar Collins, I'm political director for the Young Democrats, and I just kind of wanted to be here <sighs> and learn. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Ryan Day uh, with Local 1775. I'm their Deputy Political Director, newly appointed. Ooh, so okay. I'm here for uh, education and networking. Uh, hi, my name is Scott Candell. I am the Vice Mayor of Larkspur and I am here because you can never have too much education, so I'd love to learn more. Jean Fidel, I'm a Park and Rec Commissioner for the City of Larkspur and a possible campaign manager someday <laughs> and possibly running someday. I'm Tamara Hall. Mm. I'm on the Marine Women's Pack Board as treasurer, but I'm also thinking of running um, for City Council in Larkspur. <laughs> Partisan policy politics for the county of Marin elections department for the last 13 years, and now that I'm not working for elections department anymore, I'm getting back into uh, political candidacy and working behind the scenes. So my recent work was as fundraiser and communication director for Steve Schwartz. He ran for assembly. So yes, I'm part of you and part of the women's. Um, Political Action Committee here in Marin as well as in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. oh, great. Yeah. These little cards in front of you. This is how you join. <laughs> and this is, although it's a women's pack, we love to have men who support women's issues. We do have men, and some of them are like Damon Connolly and uh, Supervisor Rodoni and all. So we would really welcome all of you. So just grab one, and if you decide to join, we'd be so happy. Barbara, do you want to come up and introduce our speakers, please? <clears throat> so our first speaker tonight is uh, Dottie Lemieux. Uh, she's going to talk about what it goes, what goes through your mind, or how you make this uh, momentous decision to become a candidate. Um, <clears throat> Dottie, excuse my voice. Uh, Dottie has run campaigns for several years. We won't say how many. <laughs> <laughs> she's, uh, she's actually run for office herself. Uh, she's the owner of Green Dog Campaigns. And over the years, uh, she has uh, helped quite a few of the women pioneers in Warren County, such as Susan Adams, Barbara Heller, and then Shirley Zane in uh, Sonoma County, uh, reach uh, positions as uh, city council, supervisors, that sort of thing. So she's a real pro. She, she knows what it takes to uh, win an office, and she uh, not only is uh, <clears throat> a very active person in Marin, but she's also very active with the state uh, Democratic Party. So, Dottie, you're on. Hi, good to see all you people. I've got to put my glasses on. I do have handouts here, for which is really a copy of my notes, and 
I'll just start from here. So you can um, read along with me. It's an outline of what you need to do if you're thinking about running for office. So first of all, how many people here are thinking about running for office, either next year or in 2025? Hands up. That's, that's quite a few. Hopefully, that's right. So um, there are a few things that probably if you're running uh, in 2024, you're, you're probably running in the November election, which are the nonpartisan races, all this, your city councils, special districts, school boards, college board. Um, all, of, all of those sorts of things. If you're running for supervisor, and I think we have somebody here who might be doing that, you're probably off and running. So, um, because those are in March, the, there are primaries in March, and they're, all of our elections now in California are on the, uh, the presidential or the even years, either gubernatorial or presidential years. We used to have them staggered. And in some ways, it's easier to have them all at once because you get one ballot, you see everything. But on the other hand, it's made it harder for a lot of people in down ticket races. If you're running for sanitation district in Novato or somewhere, um, you're down at the bottom of the ballot. And so people have what they call ballot fatigue. And by the time they get there, they're not there anymore. So you lose them. So you have to be sure that you get out there and let them know why your race is important and why they should vote for you. So before you even get that far, you want to have um, a good reason for why you're even getting into the race in the first place. And if you look at your note, it says not why do you want to run, because most people, when you ask them why are they running, they all will say something like, they're one of two things. So-and-so asked me to run, or a whole lot of people came up and asked me to run, or I want to give back to my community. Those are great things, but that's not what the person wants to hear who is asking you the question. What they want to know is what can you do for them. So if you're running for school board and you're talking to a parent in that school board, they're going to want to know why it is that they should care about your race, not the Joe down the street wants you to run, but why, why should they want you to run? So you want to think about what your passions are first before you even decide what you're going to run for, what you're deeply passionate about. And if you're a parent with kids in the school, you may be deeply passionate about education, making sure that you have a good education, that you have art and music, that you have STEM, that you don't have people banning books. I assume that most of us feel that way in Marin County anyway. Um, and if you want to run for a city council, you may be passionate about infrastructure, making sure that the roads are functional, um, that bridges, if we have any, are working, that um, culverts and things are kept clean. And maybe you're passionate about sewers <laughs> or <coughs> our, fire, our fire, or um, we have a fire district person here, or um, water. I know we have a water uh, district candidate coming or somebody who just won in that election. So those people, I think, have been passionate about those issues and passionate about making those districts better and more responsive to the people in them. The other thing you want to think about is, are, is there an incumbent sitting in the seat that you want to run for? And if so, is that incumbent doing an effective job or should they be kicked out of office and you take their place? So you're basically, if there's an incumbent and he's running or she is running again, you want to um, be able to tell people why they should fire that person, why they're not doing a good job, and hire you to take their place. So that's something to think about months ahead of time. So, okay, we talked about the incumbents. You want to know where they stand on the issues, where you stand on the issues. You have to have the fire in the belly, the passion to run for that seat. And I'm talking about all this in advance of 2024, which is a year off, because you want to think about these things way ahead of time. You want to talk to your family. You want to see if your family is going to support you. Do they have any idea that you're even interested in running for office? They, you may be surprised. So you don't want to say to your, your spouse, hey, honey, I'm running for sewer district. Sign up is tomorrow. See you later. <laughs> you want to you get their support ahead of time. 
you also are going to have to raise money, no matter what race it is. Even if it's a very small one in a small district, you're going to have to have some money to let people know what it is that you um, care about. So you're going to want to have a handout to hand to people, something like this. So I'll just pass this around. I picked this up this weekend. A woman named Cassandra James is running in Solano County. She is very passionate. She, she's running for a supervisor in Vallejo. And she just had this uh, very short thing, kind of ex a couple pictures expressing what she cares about and who endorses her. So that when people look at that, they, they'll know something about her if they've never met her before. Um, so you want to also think about what skills you bring to this race. What special experience you have and what you have that's, that's maybe different from other people but that will really enhance the board that you're running for. If you're running for a school board, um, the skills that you have may be raising kids. They may be um, doing um, just e economic things. Um, being a, if it, maybe you're an accountant, and that's a skill that you can use on any board, but you understand the budgets. And maybe you don't understand the budgets, but you should. And so the other thing you're going to want to do is go to some of the meetings of the board that you want to run for so you can see how they operate, how things work, what, what is their budget for the year, what do they spend it on, what do people come and talk about for, in the audience, do they complain a lot, are there certain members that they're complaining about more than others, are there certain issues that are of more importance than others, and see, you know, see where you fit in that universe of that district. Get your family on board early. Um, also, your, your um, employer, wherever you work, make sure that you can take time off to run for this election because it's going to cost time and energy and, and money. You don't have to make as much money or have as much money to spend as the other candidate, but you have to have enough to get your message out. And, when, and I am not a fundraiser, by the way, <laughs> professional or otherwise. And so when Lori comes, that is what she's going to talk about because she is a professional fundraiser. But I did bring with me, just to look at, so you get an idea, this is what we call the Form 460. Those of you who are in office or have run have seen them, um, where it puts uh, how much money you're raised in a certain time period where you get your money, who gives you money, their names are all public. You can get this at the county or the, uh, the city that you're running in or the special district. Um, who's given you things that are, not mo that are not monetary but that are important to running your campaign? Like for instance, if somebody has a, a party for you and they provide all the food and they provide a place and they rent a hall, that's called an in-kind donation. You have to report that just as much as you have to report money coming in. So I just put it, pull, it, pulled a few of these sheets from Katie Rice's 460, her last one, her first one actually in 2016 when she ran, and then the last page is how you spent your money. So if you want to have an idea of how much money it will cost you to run a certain race, go back to the district that you're running in. And you can just pass this around to look at it. I only made one copy. <clears throat> you get an idea of um, how much it costs to run in that race. And you might be surprised at, at how much it really costs. It may be less and it might be more than you expect. And of course, take into consideration inflation. <laughs> also, take into consideration redistricting and the fact that most cities and, uh, and districts are now by district instead of by overall. Like the college board that Crystal's sitting on, you're in Nevada, Crystal, or where? I live in San Rafael. San Rafael, okay. You're, so you're a representative of, of that district. It used to be, uh, just a few years ago, if you were running for college board, you had to raise enough money to get your name out to the whole county, all 125,000 of them. But now you just do it by district, so that's a lot less expensive and it's easier to do. So um, you want to know where you're going to get this money. And I think Lori will probably go over this in depth. But 
So you want to, but these are things you want to do months ahead of time. You want to think about who is going to support you, who would be willing to give you money to run your race, and who would be willing to endorse you. With, where are these elected people? Are these uh, people you know personally? Are these people involved in politics or in the nonprofit world or whatever? Uh, your colleagues. And so what? Um, what there's a saying called friends and family first. And the first place you're going to look for where to raise money and to raise support, and you'll get your volunteers and all kinds of people from this circle, are your friends and your family. The people that know you the best are going to be willing to invest in you and your campaign because they love you and they want you to succeed in whatever you do. And this is something that you want, and maybe it's Aunt Gertrude who lives in Milwaukee, and she never comes here and she has no idea what the sewer board does, but she loves you and you've asked her for $50 and she's going to send it to you. And if it's your parents, your kids, your um, close relatives or friends, colleagues, people that are around you, they're going to want to help you walk precincts, you knock on doors, hand things out, stand at the supermarket in the table or do all the various things that you do to win this election. So go to those people right away before filing even comes around to get support. And, and you're going to want to do all this because at some point, and you probably want to do this early, is you're going to want to be getting endorsements. And there are endorsements that really matter. And if you're a Democrat, especially, you're going to want union endorsements. And you're going to want, if you're an environmentalist, or, and most people in Marin County are, you're going to want the environmental group's endorsements. So you want to know who endorses and what they care about. Um, the newspapers also endorse, or at least the IJ does. Um, I don't think the Pacific Sun does anymore. They used to. It used to be a coveted endorsement. They don't. Um, you might want to get the political party endorsement, the political party that you're, you're running from, even though it's a nonpartisan race, because a lot of people pay attention to that. And in Marin County, um, most people are Democrats. Uh, probably most people here are. But even if you're an, an independent, you might want to think about reaching out to people in the Democratic Party, people in the environmental groups, um, in unions. Because if you have a strong message that resonates with them, you're likely to get the endorsement, especially if you've got some conservative Republican or some, somebody that's not quite um, on the same page running against you. So these, all these institutions that I've just named, in order to get their endorsements, you have to show that you're a viable candidate already. And what that means is that you have the ability and you have raised money and that you have a campaign plan and you have people to help you implement the plan. So if you go to the firefighters, I know from talking to Kenny Martin <laughs> for years that he is going to say, show me that you're a viable candidate. Show me that you can win this election. Don't just talk to me about principles because that's great, but if you don't have the money, you don't have the support, you don't have the campaign team, you don't have a plan, why should we support you? Because you're going to lose. So you want to think of, again, all of this stuff is before you even think about signing that paper. I mean, thinking about it, but before the, the filing starts. Um, the other thing that you're going to want to do, if you have time, is think about what, I mean, we talked about experience. What um, boards and commissions or advisory boards, panels, are there connected with this seat that you may want to get yourself an appointment to so that you have some experience dealing with the people on the board. Um, the planning, the planning uh, commission is sort of the highly sought after commission in the county, countywide, and also all the towns and cities have planning commissions that they make a lot of important decisions, so you might want to look at that. But also there are uh, parks and rec uh, boards, there are uh, the Human Rights Commission, there's uh, Women's Commission, there's commission on, uh, commissions on children, on just all kinds of things. That, so you want to research what 
boards and commissions or advisory panels are there connected with the district that you may want to get a seat on or just you know and also just keep going to meetings and talking to people talking to the people that you might hear in the audience when you go to those meetings who might be kind of they might be disgruntled they might be complaining about something and maybe no one on the city council for instance is talking about what they're talking about maybe you want to go talk to them and say hey I hear you're talking about this issue, this uh, stop sign that you want to get up on, in your neighborhood, and they don't seem to be listening to you. Maybe I could come out and look at what the problem is and get an idea of, of what the voters care about. And then maybe you also want to talk to the, um, the, the people who are, who are in the seats, the people who have those positions now, people who have been on those boards and commissions previously and um, find out who else is going to be running too. So think about that in, in terms of our future competition. <laughs> I'm Lori with the dog. <laughs> um, Are you taking so questions? I, I will be in a minute. Is the time to take questions? Am I going overtime? Okay. Um, make sure they have a good base of support. When you get all those names of all those people, friends and family, and all the people that are going to support you, put them in some kind of a database. And it might be just a spreadsheet, uh, Excel spreadsheet, so you have their name, their address, their phone number, their email, who they are, they're giving you money, are they volunteers, what do they care about, so that you can go back and hit them up again. And you also will know when you've hit the, a limit, if there's a campaign uh, contribution limit, if they hit it, by giving you multiple times, then you have to you have to know that, and you can't take more money from them in that cycle. So, but it's also it's going to be really important when you run again that you have kept this information so that you don't start. I've got I've been working with some candidates that I worked with them when they ran they first ran for election. They got elected, they were thrilled, they were delighted. Now they're running for re-election. They come back and they go, well, I need to. I need to create a spreadsheet. I need to put names into it. I need to mail out uh, e-blasts to everybody and tell them what we're doing. I, loved, I said, well, don't you have all those names that you gathered last time? You had like 300 names of people that gave you money and walked precincts for you. What, what happened to that? To that? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I had a volunteer who did that, and I, I don't know. I think she put it in a, a cabinet somewhere. I mean, I wasn't, wasn't it on her computer? Yeah, but her, she left, and her computer left with her. It's like, oh, that's not good. <laughs> so have some methodology that you control. So you can have volunteers do it for you, but make sure that you can get it. It's in the cloud. It's in a nation builder account that you might use for your website. Or at least you have, you have it <laughs> somehow. Um, so make sure that you, that you have a strong presence in the community. People know who you are. You've done good things, hopefully. Um, Find out what people think about you. And you might talk to some of your friends and ask them like, hey, do you think I'm, do you think really tell me the truth? Do, do people like me? Do people think I'd be good, I'm a good politician? Or do I come across grouchy and um, ill-informed? Or, or what? And maybe a good friend will tell you that. But also Google yourself. Find out what is out there about you that you might not know. And you also might think about what did you what did you write on Facebook or Instagram or what did you put out there in the universe somewhere ten years ago that might still be lurking around. So you want to. That's why it's good to Google yourself. <laughs> and also, just if you know about something that that's other people are going to find and pick up on, even if it's not in Google, like maybe when you were um, I don't know. Maybe you were arrested when you were a, a teenager for some stupid shoplifting event, and you since you know gone straight. And you're, but somebody might find that, and if they're really out to get you, I have seen some really nasty things that people have done, and secrets that they think they're, they've dug up on people, and they've come back to haunt them because they didn't get ahead of it first. So if there's something out there, somebody else is going to find. You want to find it first and be prepared for that because. It will come out. Now, that shouldn't stop you, but you want to be prepared. 
if you've got um, lawsuits against you or you've sued your neighbor six million times because they didn't cut down their tree and you're considered a vexatious litigant and they won't let you back in court, you, you want to make you want to think about that too. Um, if there's any other negative publicity or anything about you, make sure that you take a look at it. The other thing that you're going to want to know before you get started is what is the breakdown of the district? What are the demographics in the district? Who lives there? Who votes? Who are the frequent voters? Because when you start your campaign, you're going to want to reach out to frequent voters, not just everybody who's registered, because some people never vote. You're going to want to know what their political party is, or are they independent? You're going to want to know the age. You want to know um, male, female, breakdown of the household. Uh, um, is it apartment buildings? Is it single family houses? What sort of uh, everything that you can. And there are different databases that you can subscribe to that have this information. One of the ones that we use frequently is called the Political Data, uh, Data Incorporated. And you can get, you can just go on their website and get a snapshot of your district and have a quick look at it. And for instance, this is County Supervisor District 2, since we're doing Katie Rice. And it tells me that there are 37,000 voters and they live in 19,000 households. So when you do your, get to your mail down the road, you're not going to want to mail to 37,000 people. You're going to want to mail to 19,000 households. And you're going to want to mail to less than than that because you're going to want to go to frequent voters. This is all voters. So this will tell you um, breakdown of party, <coughs> breakdown of um, whether they, they donated to political parties or to campaigns, um, whether they're likely to be LGBT. I don't know how they figure that out, but somehow they figure that out. Um, age. Um, gender, if they know it, some of them are unknown. Whether they're in a mobile home, an apartment, or a telephone, whether a telephone, <laughs> a house, whether they have a telephone, a landline, and you'd be surprised how many landlines there still are out there. Um, if they have a mobile phone that has been registered with the with the elections department, people register to vote. They have a choice of putting their phone number or not. There are some things you have to put, but you don't have to put a phone number. You don't have to put a mobile phone number, particularly. More people are doing that now. More people are putting their email. So you're getting more information um, from, the pe from people that register to vote about how to reach them. Don't bother them with a whole lot of email. They don't like it. Um, you also can get ethnicity to a certain extent. If they obviously have an Asian surname, you'll get that if it's a a Latinx surname, if it's some, and they can break down by Vietnamese, Korean, Armenian. I mean, we've got all kinds of breakdowns here. I don't know how they do all this, but some, and some of it they do by census tract. Some of it is is um, they push to put together different ways of learning about people. It's a, it, when they do this, did the census in 2010, there's other information that people hand out that they don't put on their registration forms. So. They take, they take this and put it together. And then you can find out when this person registered to vote, and that will give you an idea of how frequently they vote. You can also get on here exactly when, how many people voted in what election. Like how many people voted in November of 2022 um, would be uh, 15,000 people. 15,000 households, 27,000 of the 37,000 people who are registered to vote in District 2 actually voted. We don't know if they voted for anything more than the, the presidency. It was a presidential year, high turnout, so, um, I mean, not presidential, gubernatorial year, high turnout because of that. We don't know if they voted all the way down the ballot for everybody running for dog catcher or whatever they ran for. Um, but we do know that they voted. If you look at how many people voted in March of 2020, again, you've got a high turnout. It was a presidential year. 
and in fact you had a higher turnout in in the presidential year than in the gubernatorial year because people really cared in 2020 and so you have 32,000 out of the 37,000 that voted but if you look at um, uh, let's look at a year uh, 2021 special election of some sort 28,000 people voted so that that's pretty high for a special election in September of 2021 I don't know what was on the ballot then I don't remember but something that people cared about enough to go to vote there are often special elections because somebody gets uh, well you didn't have an election you got appointed somebody pointing at you because I know you you're in a seat that that's recent there the somebody leaves for some reason in the middle of their term the the body has a choice whether to hold a special election or to appoint somebody. In, in Crystal's case, they appointed her, but they could have held a special election and some odd time to try to get people to vote. They make, they make that decision. So there are lots of ways that you may get on the ballot, which may be, you may be surprised. Suddenly you find out that the seat that you were hoping to run for in November, the person that was sitting there left early. So suddenly, and they call an election. So all this homework that you've done ahead of time is suddenly paying off because, wow, it's a good thing. I already know how many people are in the district. I have my family supporting me. I've get, I, I know that I'm going to get money. I'm going to jump right in into this is a special election. Yay for me. <laughs> or if there's an appointment, you know so much more about the district that you can apply for it and you'll probably be number one in line. And that's another great opportunity. So I'll pass this. Katie Rice stuff around. It's public information, so no secrets here. Oh, that's the yeah, that's the PDI thing. I passed the other thing around. And I have one more. Oh, that's it. And I have one more thing to pass out. I don't have enough for everybody, but it's an article that was um, online from Speakeasy, which is a resource for candidates, and it's called uh, Speakeasy Candidate Bootcamp, and it has. A lot of what we've talked about, a little paragraph about everything. So look at that. And on the back of this, some other resources are listed. I'll just read them off to you. That are really helpful. Um, Run to Win, which I know is the name of this, but it's also the name of the Emily's List Training Center. Um, you can go online to um, emilyslist.org slash run to win. And they have... They were doing live trainings online. They're not doing any more for the near future, but they are. All those, all those trainings are um, posted there, and, and they're really, really helpful. They're great. The Emerge program, if you're planning to run in 2025, 2026, and this year it's closed, but for the future, if you're planning to run, I would recommend uh, looking into taking the Emerge program. You've I taken it? it, Nicole? How many? You've taken it? Okay. Anyone else here taken the Emerge? Graduated from Okay. It's a it's a months long program. It's not cheap. It's you have to months. apply and be accepted. But it's they, they they train Democratic women who want to run for office. There's the NWPC, National Women's Political Caucus. They have a training for candidates who are members of that organization. We used to be a part of that organization, but we're not anymore. But they still have a valuable training uh, class that you might look into. And there's a Democratic Party training October 12th. There's, it's mostly for Democrats who are running in Republican districts to try to turn a district from red to blue. But you might go to the, the uh, the site here, and just write it down if you uh, just or go to uh, California Democratic Party. It's, a, it's in California. Demand a seat. I don't know that. Oh yeah. Is, is it? Oh, it's connected with them. Great. Oh, wonderful. Great. I, I think there's ten of those, so we all have to share. Sorry. Could you uh, send out a PDF to us? I. I a PDF I can send out. Yeah, I can send out that thing I have in the PDF. I can send that thing that I'm sending. I can send it all out. Yeah. If I have, somebody has everybody's email and I'll send it to that. Somebody, Catherine or Laurel? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Anyone that wants it? Um, any other questions? I think 
that's about. I have a quick question on about endorsements. Yeah. I know that some supervisors were endorsing uh, two people in the same race. How? Um, what weight does that have when they when they uh, support? Well, then, well, it depends on how many people are running. Uh, they might. Um, it's called a dual endorsement, and people do it all the time. And they might do it because um, there's one person that they really do not want to win, and so they figure if they throw their weight behind the other two, then either one would be fine with them. Um, might be because they so they both asked them, and they just couldn't say no. I. There's different reasons why people might do that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we're done. Oh, um, do you want to take more questions? If there are any, yeah. <laughs> well, if you think they're all set to go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker is Lori Earp <laughs> of Earp Events and Fundraising. Uh, Lori. <laughs> He okay? Yeah, she's fine. <laughs> she's fine. Okay. I hope. Uh, Lori's been doing this type of work for 25 years. She doesn't look it, but she has. Uh, she partners with nonprofits and labor organizations, public sector agencies, and progressive candidates. Uh, she helps them to define their goals, their messaging, identify potential, uh, their potential, and ensure their success is achieved at every level. Yeah. Yes. It is such a pleasure to be back here. And I've just flown in from Washington, D.C., so forgive me for not being dressed professionally or anything like that. Hi, Sage, you're just fine. And my dog wanted to come with. I don't usually bring her on such presentations, um, but we'll just keep going. So I, I want to say it is always a pleasure to come present to Marin Women's PAC and to be here and to see new people running for office. How many of you are already on ballots? Because I missed that. How many of you are considering being on ballots? Wonderful. And the rest of you are just wanting to learn about fundraising and campaigning? That's awesome, because we need more of you out there. Everybody has to understand, right? If you want to take her off the leash and just let her come up here with me, that'll be fine then she can just wander. Sorry. All right. If you guys are all in pink, she's very friendly. Okay. I've never taken to her a presentation before. That door's open over there. Oh, say. It's open. It's closed. It's closed. You stay in here, thanks. Can we close the door? Yeah. Can she go up there? No, that's fine. She'll just stay. Could you close the door? Close the door? Yeah. That'd be great. All right. <laughs> so actually, this business is turning in, is 27 and a half years old. So I started it when my daughter was seven months old, and then my son was born into it less than two years later. I believe in what I do. I love doing what I do. Has anybody done fundraising before? Does everybody else love it? Yes. <laughs> yes? Yes? All right, let me see a show of hands. Here's one yes, two. All right, three. What is it that you love about it? Oh, me? Just meeting um, new people in the community and getting to know the people in the community. And what happens when you know the people? They love you. <laughs> <laughs> and they want to kid. Right? And they, wanna... they want you to win. <laughs> That's exactly right. It's about telling your story. Right? So it's what Dottie was speaking about. And the first thing in this packet is about having a clear message. Right? When you have something that you can sell, which is yourself, or the candidate with whom you're working, or the ballot measure for which you're working, it is really easy to get people enthusiastic and to want to participate. This is about the small D in democracy. Right? This is about everybody participating. I was on a statewide board of directors for CalPERG, right, wanting to get campaign finance reform, trying to get public financing. If you read about it, that effort has been going on forever. Has anybody seen public financing? No, and the costs of campaigning only go up. 
even with all the texting, and I'm on some crazy list right now. I don't know how many texts you guys have gotten today, but in a matter of 30 minutes, I had six texts asking me for money. I thought, who are you people? I don't even know. Right? So everything is judicious, but it's about the storytelling. It's about having those first three letters and what we're doing. F-U-N. Fundraising, right? If you're not having fun, you're doing the wrong thing. Let me ask, what do you love about fundraising? I love telling the passionate elevator speech story and getting people hooked. And then you sort of leave it and, oh, how can we talk some more? They're after me to tell. It is as much about listening as it is about talking. You want to hear their stories. People want to tell you. What is, in your English classes, English 101, what did your teachers tell you to write about? Yourself. That's what you know the best about. So the other person, if you listen to them, you then find your way to tell the story. And I'm sorry, person in the back, what do you love about it? Oh, um, I think it's when you have a vision and you can make a connection with somebody else um, to pursue the same vision. And when it happens, it's, it's just like magic. So. It's so true. And, and, and that's what's missing, right? After the pandemic, the next epidemic that's going on in this country right now, anybody know what it is? Right? It's depression from isolation and people not knowing how to connect any longer. It's, as we go on, this is your most valuable tool. And I don't mean just for texting and checking your email, but I mean for getting on and speaking with someone, having that connection. And the next best thing, of course, is meeting with people face to face. You need, we are a social creature, whether you are an introvert, or an extrovert, or somewhere in between, you need connections. And that, those connections, are what are gonna bring in the money, and how you're gonna spiral it out. So, what I wanna talk about for a quick minute is time. How many hours in a day do you have? It's not a trick question. <laughs> Okay, sorry, I'll go to the next person. How many hours in a day do you have? Me? Yeah. 24. You will only have 24. How many do you have? Half an hour. Oh, that's good. <laughs> All right. I also only have 24 hours. And what do we have to do in those 24 hours? Everything. Everything. Right? Oh, sleep. What a concept. Who does that anymore? Okay, sleep. You have to eat. You need to exercise. You need to work, maybe. Maybe you're a part of a sandwich gen generation and you have children at home and you have to take care of an elderly parent or grandparent. Anybody have any of those figures in your lives? That's in 24 hours. I have not found that 25th or 26th hour. So what are you going to do with it? You need to keep this. And if you're working with a campaign, fundraising time is sacred. I have one client, I have many of them who do this, but one in particular. I have carved out three to four every Monday to make call time with this person. Inevitably, three out of the four weeks, he had something else to do. We're waiting and it's gone. Guess what happens? Those days, so I, I do Irish dancing on Monday nights. I, I highly <coughs> recommend if you guys want to come to Starry Plow in um, Berkeley. Anyway, I've been noticing lately how quickly Monday comes. It's here, like the next day. Every day turns into the next week. And then you've got a month and months that have gone by. When you are scheduling your call time, it is sacred. Period, end of story. You've got to monitor it, manage it, and make sure it happens, right? So I say time keeps moving forward. And Kenneth Patton said, by labor, we can find food, water, I suggest donations, but all of our labor will not find for us another hour. So use your time wisely. If you're making calls, there's how many minutes in an hour? 60. 60 minutes. So you have to call somebody. It takes 30 seconds, maybe a minute, sometimes for them to answer the phone. Or if they have somebody else answering the phone for them, maybe it's two or three minutes if you're going to get that person. <laughs> then they're on the phone with you. 
and maybe you have to have another two to three minutes of conversation, sometimes it could go into a half hour. That's a problem, because what if you only have an hour of call time? That's a half hour. That is a lot of calls in one, right? Maybe you're getting two calls in, and that's it. You need to be quick, and that goes back to your messaging and what you're doing with that. In today's world of fundraising, it used to be when we would call through a list, we would call through that list and wait for live people because you would get live people. So what Dottie was talking about with PDI and the landlines, but on your phone, how many of you pick up phone calls from people you don't know? Does anybody pick those up anymore? I, I, I do, I have to because I work. I mean, I have kids, so they can be using someone's phone, you know, for emergencies, so I'll just pick it up just in case. I'm like you. A lot of people have my number, I, I'm on, I answer. And there's a lot of spam calls that I don't want to be taking, but... You could tell when it's a spam call, because now it comes up on your phone. Uh, it, it but it says suggested, but sometimes it's not. Those sometimes algorithms not. are not correct. And the other people that you're calling are doing the same thing. So now, my recommendation is not to wait for live people. You need to leave messages you must leave a message. So you would hope, I mean, to get through, if you make 10 calls, that's six minutes a call. Right? That's only 10 calls. And we'll get back to this. But I want you to start thinking about it because everything I do is in quantifiable chunks to get to the end, right? We're going to be given a goal by a campaign manager that says we need to raise $100,000, we need to raise $20,000, we need to raise a million dollars. That can all be incredibly daunting, but when you break it down into these quantifiable chunks, it really makes sense. And keeping time makes sense. So what is your campaign timeline? Right? For those of you who are running for office, or those of you who are going to help with managing a campaign, things like that, do you have weeks? Do you have months? You need to figure out what it is. And I keep learning all the time. Right? There's new tools available. There's no magic wand available. None. But there are new tools. And I have a campaign right now. Somebody's running for state senate. And it's really exciting. This person was elected to office two years ago. And, well, let me back up a second to what Dottie was speaking about, about databases. How many of you were born with a database? <laughs> no. How many of you have been collecting business cards all your life? What have you been doing with them? Well, it used to be Rolodex that doesn't exist anymore, so put it in my contacts. Um, but some of them are just in boxes and drawers because I don't know, at my age, they're probably not even alive anymore. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So, I, but I kept them. But you kept them. And did you write the date that you met somebody or did you put a dollar sign if they were good for money or anything like that? Any details? No, I wasn't running, a, I wasn't in a campaign. I, most of us weren't, and most of us aren't thinking that way. But from this point forward, you guys are going to think this way. So even when, like there's a lot of people now who have the electronic business cards that they give you, right? Or I, I will text my information to somebody. When somebody does that for me, I take a moment because there's a note section and I will put date that I met them, where I met them, something because a name and a phone number is not that good. You don't have, <laughs> you don't have that um, information at your fingertips and unless you are some incredible savant that can remember all of that from all the people you meet, you need to start keeping notes. You need to have a list that you can work with. I have one client, one of all the many, he gets an A++++. When he was running for office, and he's the county treasurer in Alameda County, so I'll give props to Hank. He said, what do I do? The man had been a campaign treasurer for years. He had been involved in the community for years. So while he didn't have a database, he had a phone, he had emails, and what is easy, though you have to do a few steps, you can download all those contacts. 
and they download it into a CSV file, right, comma separated values, and you, you import it into an Excel file. And he spent hours with this list, and he ranked all those people, and he came up with asks. He also was not born with a database, and he was born at a time of Rolodexes and stuff like that. But all of these are tools, right? And you can sit and process over it. You just need to get the information available to you. And it is critical because every, the foundation to your fundraising is predicated upon a list. And obviously these campaigns have bought a list or have had a list made available to them that has Lori Earp on it and my cell phone and I'm getting all their texts. I don't get up in arms about it, I delete them. I mean, if I see somebody I know, I, I, I'll do that. I'll keep it, I'll be interested. Don't get frustrated, just press delete. Whether it's in your inbox, in your mail, or your phone, delete. You know, get frustrated over the fact that our government might, might be shut down. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yes? Are you okay with questions as you're going? Uh, yeah, please. I, I, All right, so, I was listening to you talk about how much everybody loves fundraising. I hate it. Oh, no. And I hate it because I hate asking people for money. Yep. Right? And I'm the guy who, like you said, I can talk to somebody for half an hour on the phone because I enjoy listening to them. You know, and, oh, tell me what's important to you. And, and you know, all those things. I, I love that. But at the end of the day, I hate to say, all right, well, thanks. Can I have some money? You know, and, and I don't understand how... I, I would love over the course of this presentation to kind of understand how that works and how to love it and not hate it. Really. So I think a part of my materials is actually a script. So I, I've actually given you a script and where, how that gets woven in there and I'll, I'll look through it. I'm pretty sure I did. Don't look at it now. Uh, but, um, but to, so to answer your question about it, one, you have to change your attitude. So one, you need to embrace the, like I say, the democracy, right, the small d, and what this is in creating that opportunity. Big donors get me closer to the goal when there's not a campaign contribution limit, right? If there is, I have to deal with that. And there is the Glazer bill that everybody who's not running for state office, assembly, senate, or higher, all has to deal with that now, and I will be responsible and tell you about that. But that means that some of you may be limited to $249, whatever the uh, local limit is. People do want to hear from you, and you're going to fundraise in concentric circles. You're going to first call the people you don't have to think about, your family members, your high school best friend, your college best friend, your associates, things like that. Those are the people you call first, and I, I love this. Um, I usually call those the friends and family, family and friends. Someone I was just meeting with the other day calls it the three Fs of fundraising. Friends, family, and fools. So, <laughs> right, they'll do anything for you. Your long lost aunt that just adores you. All you have to say is, auntie, I'm working on this issue. How much do you need, right? I, I didn't have that, but if you have that, it's good. I think it's about getting the win. It's about, and, and I don't mean that in a mercenary way. It's when you believe in what you're doing so much and you know that you have to pay for postage and printing and office space maybe and signs and whatever else, you know, social, it, it, everything costs money and you want to get it funded, you want to win, whatever it is, you are going to start to ask for money. And it's not just about asking, it's about knowing how much to ask for and putting out the ask for that amount. It's really, really important. One client who's new at this, she's like, yeah, they said they're gonna give money. How much? I don't know. Why didn't you ask? Because, right? It happens all the time. If you don't make the suggestion, it's not gonna happen. You need to put it forward. And if you say, Oh my gosh. Okay, so he, this is, I, I, I'm brand new at this. I'm doing a political campaign for a woman who had no right to run for state senate in Southern California. And I mean, she's a, a lovely human being, but she was not ready for this at all. And somebody had given me a list to call. I was her fundraiser. Um, anyway, 
I, I was asked to call Don Henley. He was on the list. Does everybody know Don Henley? Yeah. So I call Don Henley and leave a message. My boss comes in a little bit later. So Don Henley returned Lori's call. And I was like, hi, Mr. Henley, how are you? I'm really good. What are you calling about? Oh, this crazy woman running for off. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> anyway, but I knew he was a progressive. I knew the issues. I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. But I had in my mind, if I could get $10,000 out of him, I thought that that would be magnificent. And we're talking, and it turns out I had seen it his revival concert a few years, like a few weeks ago in Irvine, and so we're talking about that. What do you think of the concert? Anyway, I, he said, so tell me more about this candidate. I tell him why, and he said, so what are you thinking? And I said, well, would you make a contribution of $10,000? Sure. <laughs> that was easy. That was my first five-figure donation. Or was that only a fourth figure? I forget. Anyway, it was, but I put out the amount. I put out the energy. If I had asked for $1,000, I would have not gotten that extra 9000 So you have to have that in mind. And yes? So he would say, no. Now what do you do? Oh, well, when he says no, I say, could you tell me why? You don't start bargaining. Not, no, the negotiation's on his end. So I, I, I really feel that you could do the $10,000, and that $10,000 is going to move the needle a lot. We're running against a really horrible candidate. He's very right-wing. He is very problem in comparison to the right-wing today. But at the time, he was a very right-wing candidate. And you have the opportunity here to make a change, to elect somebody who's going to shift things for us in the state. I, I, I really... When they say no, so that's a different story, and I still want to get, I want you to feel comfortable about this. And I think you need to have, have you fundraised? And then I'll get back to this. Awesome. Not really, but, but just my, my life trajectory is, is I, I have a hard time asking people for anything. You know, it's just not my nature. So it, it's difficult for me to, to ask for things. You know, and especially money to ask somebody, hey, you know, Right. If you like me, can you give me some money? <laughs> you know, it just feels so weird. Years ago, I had a different business. Um, I designed and imported jewelry and um, other things. I, the business name was Andiamo. I, I felt real. It was very easy for me to say you owe money to Andiamo. <laughs> <laughs> but not to Lori. I, I want to say I understand that. I empathize with it. And people really want to support you. you no, I, I think I've seen you before. I've seen you in action uh, at Jackie Elwood's. That would be yes. That was you. <laughs> and I went to one of her fundraisers. And so I actually seen you in action fundraising, which was amazing. Oh, because I had a great time. That fundraiser was just everything. So well, I just wanted to put that up. And I'm going to talk about Jackie in a second. <laughs> oh, uh, specifically. <laughs> it, it, thank you. It, it, is it, it, it is believing. Right? You, you cannot do this if you don't believe in yourself. If you don't believe in the candidates that you're working for. I, I've been calling the same donors for 27 and a half years. Sometimes they take my calls and sometimes they don't. <laughs> and sometimes even I feel like, oh my gosh, I'm, and I said it to a major donor in a, a message today. I said, I'm always coming to you with my hands out. However, it's really because our values are aligned and these issues and candidates or nonprofits are things you believe in and they're opportunities for you to move it forward. And I do believe that. And so, and that's why they call me back and they write checks. And once you start to have that experience, there's a, it doesn't have to be hubris, right? There's not arrogance in this. There's no assumption that anyone's ever going to give. But when you put your entire campaign together with a clear message, you need to know why you're running. You need to know why you're working for the person you're working for. And if you're only working for that person for a check, you're not in the right place. It's going to show. You can't be there. Especially because, to Jackie, right? So here's this 
neophyte of a candidate, pretty much, right? She's running for Senate. She's running for Senate. And she's been in office for two years. And she's come from, she's moved from Congo, right? She does, so she doesn't have a database. You have to work the process and believe in it. And it, you plant seeds, and this is what I've learned. What I've learned to be able to tell people, like I know the process, right? I know that it takes seven to nine touches before somebody may give. When you get to those outer concentric circles, those inner concentric circles should be giving you something immediately. The rest are gonna take a few touches. In three to four months of working with Jackie in particular, we are getting major endorsements and people maxing out to her. Right? And the rest of the team that's been pounding me every week at our weekly meetings, how come the money's not coming in? Where's the money? Where's the money? It's like, I am working it. I am working it. And I knew I was. I knew we were in the right places. But there are processes, especially when you're doing late organized labor and other organizations. There are questionnaires you have to fill out and interviews. It doesn't happen like that which is why to get your campaign seated and to get yourself to a tipping point where other people, insiders, are gonna look at this race and say it has viability, you must go to those three Fs, family, friends, and fools, all right? And those are the people that are in your favorites on your phone. Those are the people that shouldn't require a lot. Those are the people you should um, do some test runs with, right? And see what it feels like to put yourself out there and say, I want to run for office. And you are going to run for office? I'm actually in office now. Yeah. You're in office? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've been telling the story. Well, it, the, the short version is I had some people give donations. I didn't actually ask for anything. But campaign manager did. And, uh, and then nobody ran against me, so nobody ran against me, so I didn't need to do a campaign, so I didn't need to raise money. But I just know, I mean, I have a law practice, and I was just reminded my accounts receivable are probably a quarter million dollars because I can't ask my clients for money because I feel bad. It's, just, it's, it's difficult for me to do, not, not that I don't believe in the value of me or my services or what I'm providing, it's just difficult for me for some reason. Maybe. <laughs> And it's not easy. So invoicing is the worst part of my business, right? So, so and that's me invoicing for me. So I, again, I want you to know I empathize. I'd rather put time in to calling for money for my clients than I would to make sure that I've got that I'm getting paid. It, 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 so so I understand. But you're in office. You didn't have opposition, but you have an opportunity to now help people who are also running, who you believe in because you're an elected official, right? So those are, that's a responsibility, that's good leadership, that's helping to find successors and all those kinds of things, right? A leader is only as good as it's their succession plan and you should embrace that, in my opinion. So how do you ask people for money? Someone else who loves it, what has it been for you to, or somebody who wants to try, <coughs> that has, wants to explore it, is neutral to this fundraising. I, I want you guys to leave here not necessarily loving it, like I do, because I do, but at least to feel like I can do it, that I'm competent, I'm not afraid, I'm not going to, I don't know, you know, bristle when it's time to make the calls or find every excuse. Um. And then I'll say that she, she jokingly said like therapy or something because it's clearly it's a um, it's a block because he's he's brilliant at what he does but asking clients to pay him for it he stumbles on it the same thing fell through with campaigns right but my philosophy is and it's just across the board is the only thing someone can tell you is no and that's okay how your response when you say well can you tell me why is perfect like. You have to get to a point where you, I feel people end up feeling personally offended by that no. And when you ask for sponsorship money or hard money or 
can you do this for me? And I have a circle of friends. I got to tell you, I get them to do all kinds of stuff. I know they ain't doing it. <laughs> but you have to ask, and if they say no, okay. That's okay. I'll just keep moving on. And I think you have to get to that place where you don't mind hearing that word. We're so afraid of that word. And you have to get there, I think. I agree. And it's not personal. It usually right. has nothing to do with being personal in any way. Sorry, I'll, I'll just tell you, I have a friend who's a police officer, and she tells me, she told me the best story ever was people come at them, you know, sometimes crazy, you never know, right? It's such a hard job. And she has the best philosophy, and she said, you know what, they're not mad at me, they're mad at the uniform. And so I, I sort of incorporate that into the philosophy. They may tell me, they're not telling me no, they're telling me for what I'm asking, and I can live with that, and just keep moving on. There's a variety of reasons, and then I'll take yours and then your question. I, there are friends of mine within the nonprofit world that lead ongoing workshops with families to talk about money. Right? There is, we don't talk about how much we earn, we don't talk about the troubles we're in, we don't talk about that. And if we did, maybe there'd be less issues. Right, you know, but we don't, and there, everybody has a relationship to money, and one has to acknowledge that. That said, a campaign costs money, and again, once you're an official, you're an elected official. There are, there's a whole crop of other people that want to be there too, and you, as an elected official, should have the funding sources to be able to write them checks. And you should be able to let your donors know, no, I didn't have opposition, but I want to support other people so that I have more votes on my board in order to move our issues forward. I mean, there's a lot of reasons that you can, should make people want to give. I mean, they're going to want to give to you. I, I, I believe that. And once you start doing it, I mean, there's not... A, a, I do know more than a handful of office holders that enjoy the fundraising and don't have enough time to do it. They love it. I, I, I mean, it, it's, it builds upon itself. It's like a snowball, right? You, you are effective, you're good at it, then do it because you can spread that wealth. Not everybody else, given the office they're running for, that people know about it, like a city attorney. Right? It, that's a hard race to raise money for. You get money from attorneys, but a lot of people don't know what it is. The district attorney. So who's going to give to that? Well, that's something that you can give to, right? And you can get others to give. So those are my thoughts. We'll keep coming back. I was just thinking that yes is a gift because you, you know immediately what you're going to get, but no is also a gift, especially when you keep it open-ended. At least then you know what their threshold is and you can work from there. Um, and having them offer that counter of what they can do for you puts them in the position of reflection. Nice. And even if they're not able to give, don't want to give, they're gonna give you feedback and you can use that. Mm -hmm. And it lets you know, what do they think about you? What's your priority in their list of the ballot you know, um, opportunities for voting? I think every interaction's a gift. Agreed, and again, it's that listening that provides that. And Depending on where the no goes or what the conversation is, if they say, you know what, I'm really, you didn't know this, but I've been taking care of my elderly mother, right? So my obligations are kind of stretched at this time. I understand, can I come back to you in a month or two, mm -hmm. right? Or when you put out a specific amount of, say, $500, can I count on you for $500? Not right now. Well, would you be willing to do a hundred dollars right now? I saw you wearing a thousand dollar pair of shoes, but uh, you know, would you do a hundred dollars right now and for the next five months? Because people can do it again. They can give monthly, and it, remember, quantifiable chunks. So I'm making a hundred dollar donation, a five hundred dollar donation, because I have them give it for five months. But I, I totally agree, and it's listening, it's dialogue. That's what makes you different than a telemarketer. <laughs> Right, the tele. I, I've never been a telemarketer, but from having been on the receiving end of those calls, it's about closing the deal. This is about having relationships. 
In the fundraising world, in the nonprofit world, do you know what those people are called often? Like a fundraiser for a nonprofit? A, a what? A developer. A d development, develop, right, they're development director, development associate. Do you know why it's called development? Bingo. That's exactly right. So that's what you're doing also. We don't call that in political fundraising, but if you're not cultivating these relationships for the long run, you're in the wrong business, right? Because you need them everywhere. And well, I was just going to add, you, you basically, you and uh, Crystal said, basically what I was going to say, um, you have to know, because I did fundraising before, and I also had to raise money in my personal life so I know what it is to ask people for money. And you have to know who you're asking and where they're coming from. Because they might, you, you know their, their pay range, they might not have it. So if you're gonna ask, ask, you say, can I have, can you have $25, you know? And then you gotta know who has money and how much money you're gonna ask for. So it's a range of, um, just like you know, Crystal said, uh, just knowing who you're asking people that you're reaching out to. That, exactly. So when you're creating your list, right, and where you start with your phone or your Outlook, <laughs> something, you rank it in priorities, right? So who's in the innermost circle? Those are your number ones. Then outside, the twos, threes, etc. How are you going to prioritize? And then how much you're going to ask everybody for, right? So you want to know that quick anecdote about a good friend, she and her husband would regularly give $5,000 checks. She received a request for a $25,000 donation and she threw it out. She told me the story, right? She said, they should know. I give $5,000. I don't have to, I'm not giving 25. I mean, even if she gives multiples, which means she probably has the capacity, she doesn't do it that way. She gives 5,000. So she said they asked for the wrong amount. In the same way, when Don Henley said, yes, you know, I was so excited. I was a kid. I got $10,000. That felt really good. It was really good. But maybe I could have gotten more. It was too easy. So you have to keep that in mind. And can I come? I want to go back to what you said. It's also about going back to people. If now is not a good time for us to speak, now is not a good time for you to give. May I call you back in a week? Do you want me to call you back in a month? And it goes on your calendar so that you follow up. The door is always left open. I have a question. Um, I work for a nonprofit, and something that we do is sometimes we like make it ta really tangible, like a menu. So, like uh, you know, we we actually like um, monetize or not monetize, but we like quantify what each layer would cost. So I sometimes think like it's easier for me to ask can you pay for a bus for the students and that's fifty fifteen hundred dollars or can you pay for a retreat for the kids or a professional development for a school which is fifty thousand dollars then saying like will you just donate fifty thousand dollars to the organization so i wonder is that a strategy that you could transfer over to the campaign and if you if yes have you used it before and does it work yes so i haven't even gotten into the fundraising plan and how much you need to raise so if it's a hundred thousand dollar campaign and you're going to need to spend it in 10 weeks you need to raise ten thousand dollars a week so it's one thousand so many dollars every day so I don't do it exactly like that, though at some point you could say, I need to buy signs, I need to buy buttons, I need to buy remittance envelopes. We need to do something like that. Can I count on you? Can I count on you? Can I count on you for a $500 donation? What I tend to do with my clients is to give a daily goal and then they get a say to the person on the other end of the phone, I've got a $10,000 goal. Will you get me 10% of the way there right now with a $1,000 commitment? You can go online, right? Have texts ready with a link that you can send to them as a follow-up. Have emails ready as follow-up that you can send to them, something like that. So that's how I do it. And at the end of the day, my fundraiser, always blame it on your fundraiser, 
my fundraiser set a goal of ten thousand dollars we're at eighty five hundred will you give me the last fifteen hundred right so it's a very similar thing but a little different but I, I, I people want to again they feel good because you've asked them. You've thought enough to ask them to give. People want to participate. They really, 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 really do. Right? So you're giving them that opportunity, and they're going to give what they can. But once you put the ask out for the specific amount, who brought up the negotiation part? Uh, yeah, we don't do that. So... I say, Catherine, it's Lori, how are you? <coughs> You're doing well? Yes. Great. I am running for office. My fundraiser told me I have to raise $10,000 today. I'm at $8,500. Can I count on you right now for $1,500? Oh, gosh, Lori, I have really serious obligations. I could try to give you maybe $250. i am so sorry I can't. Do you think you could stretch that to 500 then I only have to call two more people? Well, how about halfway in the middle? So We'll do 375. Yeah. I'm so sorry, I really can't at this time. I, I, let's do 375 now, and then can I, count, can I call you back in a few weeks? Yeah, that would be better. I get my next income check for yeah. Perfect. I'm putting you down for 375. I will send you a link right now. Do you want me to text it to you or email it to you? A text would be great. Perfect. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. And by the way, before we hang up, are there a couple of other people that I could call using your name? Yeah, I think I have a couple of names that might be interested in supporting your candidacy. I'm not sure if they live in your district, but I would be happy to give it to you. That would be fantastic. And the good news is, as long as they are U.S. residents, I can take their money from whatever district they live in. So thank you. I'll send that information. All right. All right. So there's always another ask. <laughs> are you ever dropping in, um, by the way, can you put up a yard sign? And I know you live on Highway 37. Can we put a giant sign? If, if that's the case, then I would. But me as the fundraiser, not so much. And that would be for this closer room. Yeah, but actually, and it's not true. I, I mean, so I'm a different kind of fundraiser, I, I, I think, that I, I'm really, really, really invested in my campaign's winning. Oh, I only have 10 minutes? Oh, my gosh. Okay, I'll be quick. So anyway, yes. But does, has everybody seen a remittance envelope? Yes. All right, so you don't need one of these. Okay. But on the remittance envelopes that we pass out, it's got all that information. All right, so let me be quick. The materials here are really good for you, I promise. And that first page is really important about what makes the, uh, 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 oh, the uh, perfect. So what makes the winning fundraising campaign team and then what we're gonna be doing, right? So you need this clear message you need a working database. Excel is okay, but it's pretty flat unless you know how to use pivotal tables and other pieces. So databases such as Nation Builder, NGP are good to use, right? And you can email out through them and that way you can track the donations when they come in. You need to have realistic goal setting, meaning you need to know from your campaign consultant how much you need to spend on everything. And then you need to figure out each week, each day, how much you need to raise. You need to put together that fundraising plan, and the fundraising plan is gonna include all of these pieces. House party program, there's a difference between a campaign house party and a fundraising house party. With a fundraising house party, like with a fundraising call, you are gonna have a specific ask and goal. Anybody can host an event. Oh, I want to do a party for you. That, that's great. We want it, if it's a fundraiser, do you have a minimum of a $2,500 goal? Do you have a minimum of $5,000? And then again, you break it out in quantifiable chunks. If it's $5,000, that's 50 people at $100. Or it's five people at $1,000. Whatever it is, you break it out for them to help them see that they can do it using their lists. 
mail is still really effective with fundraising because you're going to be doing your phone calls and it's really nice to get a letter in somebody's mailbox with a remittance envelope saying I'm going to be calling you I'm running for office I want you to participate these are the endorsements I've got this is my quick you know my quick platform join us and then you call them five to seven days later if they haven't sent in the remittance envelope did you get my letter Oh, I saw it. it's on my table. I really need you to give. Can I count on you for that $500, right? We're always putting in that amount. Thank you letters are critical. Thank you letters are critical. You want to thank people, especially before you go back to ask them, because the most likely donor is who? Okay, before. That's correct, right? So in my fundraising um, the development plan, I will include resolicitations because that's really important. You will get at least 30 to 40% of them to give again and again and again and again. Call time, record keeping, because you need to know. Yes? I was going to ask you, when it's a repeat donor, let's just say they give you $250. Yes. Uh, when you're doing the ask, are you increasing the amount? Or are you staying at the same level? Uh, it depends. <laughs> I, I could say you last gave $250. I was hoping you'd increase it by another 10%, right? The expenses have gone up, so you can do it that way. And sometimes, yeah, I, I like to drive it up, but I want to make sure I get that gift. Usually they give a little less in, in political campaigns. That's been my experience. So you want to get them to keep giving. Um, monitoring your own solicitation calls, again, making sure they're happening. Endorsements are vital. Endorsements are vital. Again, back to Jackie's campaign because it was called out. People are like, why are you working on all these endorsements? Endorsements lead to money. Right. Endorsements lead to people. Get your endorsements. Get those endorsements. And then we started with time. I do have a gift for you, how to give you more time. It's having a finance committee. If you only have 24 hours in a day, but you have 10 people who love you, and they have 24 hours in a day, you've just increased it by another 240 hours, right? So you get somebody on your finance committee that loves you and will raise $5,000. If you have 10 people who will raise $5,000 from their circles, 10 times five, right? We're gonna have another $50,000. This is how it works. And one of the articles that Barbara was kind enough to copy is one on finance committee. Read it, implement it, find those people, and then don't have them be afraid of asking for money. You cannot be afraid to ask for money. Not in this world, you can't. Because the postal service will not mail anything without stamps. Postage is going at it. Printers will not print if they don't have money. It has to be COD. You need the money. And you don't want to be financing it on your own. So I think I've touched on everything I would for you guys to be successful. It's kind of quick. There's just never enough time. Yeah, you have 15 more minutes. Oh, I do? Oh, I was told I had 10 a second ago. Okay. Wow, look at that. I just got a gift of time. Okay. Oh, I love that. Somebody, like, did the dishes for me and said I, I made, gave you time. Okay. So let's go into the finance committee a little bit more um, because I really want you to understand it and to do it. So has anybody been on a finance committee or worked with a committee that had a finance committee? Tell me how that worked for you. Well, I actually was my own finance committee. <laughs> that doesn't count. <laughs> when I ran for office, and that. I don't recommend anyone to do that. Like, that's the worst thing. Like, filling out the FPPC. And oh, that's different. That's your treasurer. Okay, my treasurer. Okay. And you guys are going to have Mark Kyle here in a couple of weeks. Yeah. So. Well, I was everything. Like, yeah. And I don't recommend anyone to do that. A good, a good leader has a succession plan and people to whom they can delegate. A and you definitely want a treasurer that knows how to do everything yes. legally. I am proud to say that none of my candidates, office holders or otherwise, have ever been in the news for anything bad. 
So I, I, I'm going to keep it that way. So, but that requires the professionals. Finance committee. Has anybody worked with a finance committee? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've worked with the finance committee, and the worst part of the finance committee was the candidate was on it. You know, when the candidate can get out of the way and let us do the finances, you know, and really focus on what we were doing, what our job is, it made it so much better. Because I found that the candidate was actually micromanaging a little bit, because he was using one of his lists, and this person should give this much, and this person should give that much. It's like, wow, that's great, man. We need that sort of thing, but... You know, it just went down a little too much where he could be focusing on something else, somewhere else, talking to someone else. He was talking to us. So how much money did you guys have to raise? Oh, we raised about 80000 Did you? Did each of you have a goal? We, not, we know because he managed the goals. He's like, just make the phone calls and get them out there. And it's like, yeah, we should know how much we're doing. But when we had the house parties, we had fundraising parties, so we always had an expectation of how much we wanted to raise. Like at those parties, we raised, you know, 20, 30, 20,000. That's a good thing. A good so party. to serve on like the presidential finance, finance committee many years ago, they had to raise like $235,000, right? And so, and there's the limits. And, but if in those stratosphere, right, they ask 10 of their friends to match them at the then $23,500 limit. And so you bring it, I mean, you have to raise a lot of money to run for president. But at this level, I mean, those, those are good numbers. That was a good, those were good numbers. And we had some good success. How many, finance, how many members were on the finance committee? Four people. So, you know, it was a big group. And some of them wore different hats as well. You know, I wore the other hat of communications, so fundraising and communications. And then we all went up to Sacramento to, you know, work the different lists. Yeah. The thing about a finance committee in general, in my opinion, or when people are hosting fundraisers, the fundraisers that are exhausting to me, uh, fundraising events, are when people ask me to use our list, the campaign list. Now, the whole point of having a finance committee member is that they're bringing in a new list, right? They have their own circle of contacts, and we want them to energize and activate those lists. Because otherwise, I could keep planning events and uh, the same people. They're going to just get exhausted by it. So I don't recommend that at all. Yep. This may be a silly question, but do you pay your finance committee? No. Can you? Why? I don't know. No, you pay a fundraiser. And you pay a fundraiser to manage your finance committee. But, and again, to, uh, no. I mean, no. You do not. Good to know. One of my first races, there was a finance committee of one for a judicial race. A judicial race is one of the hardest races. Has anybody participated in a judicial race? So, yeah, right? one of the hardest races to raise money for. And so, again, that is the friends, family, and fools. That's the list. And the attorneys. But there was a, this kind, kind gentleman, may he rest in peace. He was just such an amazing guy, an icon, a businessman down in Santa Clara County. He single-handedly raised the money because of his relationships. He wasn't paid. He just liked the guy. He didn't even have cases that would come before the judge, right? Thankfully, that wasn't why he did it. He just he believed in this person, and he motivated and called all of the people in his world and raised all the money we needed. So why was I paid? That's a really good question. But but if somebody had to manage it, had to get the thank you letters out, had to let him know when it. Right? There are things that people like me do, and. Um, I justifies my lack of sleep. Yeah. Make one comment. You were talking again about repeat phone calls. Yes. So I was leaving messages on landlines and with repeat phone calls, and I'd say, I'm going to call you back on Thursday. Well, this guy, he just had a busy schedule, and he said, I was waiting for you to call me on Thursday, and we missed the call. We called him on Friday, and he wanted to know why didn't we call on Thursday, because he had, that's when he had his checkbook out. So then, you know, you talk him down, well, thank you so much. Your checkbook is still right there, right? Or, you know, These are really good anecdotes. I mean, 
follow through is really important. It's really, really important. And knowing what you're doing. Have, if you have your tools in place, you have a calendar, you have a list, you have a phone, you have your email, right? You have your website set up, ready to take donations. Those are the things that you need. If you have something like Act Blue, or which is not a database, but it is a vehicle to accept money, as you know, you can set up separate pages for every initiative. That way you can track and see the success. So maybe you have the Latino community that's doing some work for you. So you have a page and a link specific to the Latino community. You're an attorney and the attorneys are raising money. So you have an attorney link, right? And you create these initiatives around it when you have events. Those are things that are really, really helpful. So you can see where your energies should be spent. If you belong to a house of worship, that is a great place to go because people know you. You cannot use the roster of your house of worship wholesale. It should say that when they were printed, it would say it right in front. This may not be used for solicitation purposes. It doesn't mean you can't use it as a reference, right? Oh, my kid is in Sunday school with this family. I'm going to call them. I know this one. That's, where, that's what it's for. It's like a phone book, and it's okay to use it that way. You want to collect all this. Have all these tools. Have a mailing address. A lot of donors, institutional donors, will need not a P.O. box. It needs to be a physical mailing address. Have that available and on your um, remittance envelope. A kitchen cabinet is different from your finance committee. You need a kitchen cabinet. You need people who will go to the grave with a lot of secrets, right? People you can trust and, and have that. Have those as people you can role play with to do the practice, to do the ask, to start to feel comfortable about what you're going to do. Does anybody do polar plunges? So I, I, I love polar plunging. And at the North Sea, you name it, the OC, I, I'm there on December 31st. But it's cold. It's much easier to just jump in. But you can do a practice run, right? So, so figure it out. Get that and do that. And then be regular in your asks. Really get into a rhythm. People ask me, what is the best time of day to make your calls? Anybody know? It's when you're at your best. It's hard to believe, I think even from this presentation, that I would ever go monotone. But I do at some point during the day, and as soon as I start going monotone, I get off the phone. That is never gonna be good. No, like I'm gonna call and say, hi, this is Lori. Would you like to give? I mean, who's gonna give, right? They, I, I tell my staff all the time, smile. They hear your smile on the other end. They receive it. People, it's infectious. People want to keep growing with you. So let them have that opportunity to do that. I think I probably have five minutes. So I do want to tell you about this Glazer bill. Does anybody know about it? So the governor signed this bill into law last December. And Steve Glazer, senator from uh, the La Mirinda area, with whom I have a lot of gripes, and this is one of them. He wrote this legislation and people weren't watching, so there's other people I could have a gripe with. And what it does is that if you're running for a particular office and a donor might have an issue that comes before you a year before or a year after they make that donation, so it's almost a two-year prohibition, they can only give you up to $249. So, for example, in Contra Costa, the, uh, the contribution limit for running for supervisor is $1,675, or they just raised it a little bit. Anyway, that's what it used to be. But if somebody has an issue before the um, Board of Supervisors, unless you want that board member to recuse themselves from your issue, they may only contribute up to $249. It's a, I, I, nobody knows how they're going to be able to manage it, but I want you to be aware of that so that you don't get caught. A, a, and 
you just have to return the money. But if you're paying a treasurer and they're collecting and depositing the money and then they have to write a check to refund the contribution, it's a lot of money that you're out. So watch out for that, it's um, SB, no, AB, SB 1439, I think it is. And have fun, trust the process. Put your pieces together. Make the time. Make the calls. Have your follow-up. Do the thank yous. And have fun. And win. <laughs> Any other questions? So, so I was reading your packet, and um, um, you kind of hear about social media that you um, deleted your twi Twitter account. I did. Oh, <laughs> does it say that in there? And then it says which one, which other one? Yeah. Uh, oh, there's an article that says that they think they're Oh, got it. I thought it, I thought it was yours. So I don't have enough time on social media. I don't do a lot of it, but I believe in it. Go ahead. So, how long should you keep your account open? I mean, after you're already elected to office, if you think this is going to be your last or only term, do you think you? Once you open an account, you just leave it, and then you use that account. If you have left over, what do you do with that money? Do you donate to other candidates? You do. Okay. You Until do. Until it's gone, in other words. Yeah, and then you spend it down. Okay. And maybe you give it to the Democratic Party or whatever party that you're involved with. But yeah. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Yes? So what about, because I hate asking for nature. Donations too. What if I just want to fund my my entire campaign myself? Michael Huffington did that. <laughs> <laughs> There's a few other people that tried. Why would you do that? I don't know. I don't like asking for money. I don't think it bodes well for you as a public servant. Now, am I again? That's my uh, and uh, there are too many people that have tried that don't win. Um, it, it doesn't look good. I mean, what Dottie was talking about in terms of press and things like that, I, I just don't think you can. Shouldn't you at least seed your own campaign? No, never. No. <laughs> okay. We disagree on that. Yeah. I, uh, I think you should put in a little bit. I feel like if you don't put money in, then do you, it's like you, you don't believe in your, you're saying, I don't believe in myself enough to put my own money in. So this is what I, the, when and where I would do that and have had other people do that is if we're nearing the reporting period and right there's a tipping point for people looking at the race, your reporters and other people to talk about, wow, this candidate is viable. Sometimes that's $100,000, it all depends on what you're running for. If you're at 90,000 and you can lend yourself $10,000 to give yourself 100, that's great. But people are going to know that you gave yourself the money. I, I yeah. They're, yeah, they're going to know when the reporting period is. But it's, um, and you should always do it as a loan. The only thing you can pay for without, without it being, you can just write a check for it without opening a bank account. You have to have a bank account and you have to be filed before you can start taking money, including giving to yourself. But you can, um, and you should probably, when you sign up uh, with a registrar, and you should just oh, yeah. pay for your, your balance. Right here. That doesn't count for your yeah. thing. But if, if you do put money, your own money in, make sure you call it a loan, because you want to be able to get it back. Something. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> I, I started in talking about the small D in democracy, and I don't think we want office holders that are buying their offices. So uh, that, that's just me. I mean, consultants want you to pay for everything, yeah, so they I want you to... I want you to pay for me. <laughs> <laughs> I always say, you know, do put in a little a bit at the beginning to show people that you do believe in yourself. I, I'm, you know, I put in $5,000 or $200 or something because I'm running for this office and I'm serious about it and I'm putting some money in to start. So I want you to help me go on from there. And, then you, and that's where you tell your friends and family. That's what you start with. So by the time it gets to the outer circle, it doesn't look like you're financing your own campaign. But it sometimes helps you know, your, your friends and family to feel like you are contributing. Because you are. You're right a lot. Yes. I just think, I mean, for me, I mean, I'm, 
been a fundraiser for years for other things, not political campaigns. And when you do that, it's also an opportunity to friend raise. And so if you're not fundraising and funding your own campaign, you're missing the opportunity to understand your constituents. So you need to understand, they need to know who you are. Because you're also buying, I mean, they may not give you money, but you're also getting them to vote for you. Right. So you need so, to be out there doing that. So I serve on a lot of boards. And I believe in peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. When I'm talking to my nonprofit world, I tell my donor, my board members, you cannot ask people for money if you haven't given yourself. Mm -hmm. So that's in that nonprofit world, and I believe that wholeheartedly. In the political world, again, Daddy and I would have polite disagreements on this, and that's okay. And I have candidates that have had to put money in for a variety of reasons. So it's not that it doesn't happen, but I really, really, really believe that if you don't have that support from the community, that you have no right to be running for office. Where, however much you have to put in at some point. That, that's, you know, yes. Yeah, and how, how do you go about, I'm just asking this for everyone, how do you go about writing those real clear statements about what you believe in? How do you distill that down? You work with people on that to come down. You want to go through your life, and there are other people that do messaging, it's part of my role, but, right, so you're going to come up with your life story, and you're going to find and pull out those two to three gems maybe three to five, actually, you'll pull out three to five gems of your life that you can then use intermix, right? They'll use them interchangeably depending on your audience. You are the same you, but I, I, I'll leave the messaging to other people. But for us, when you're asking about money, you're gonna, you're gonna talk about your viability. You're never gonna talk about your opposition. When are you going to talk about your opposition? Never. 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 Never by name. Never. They have to work to get their airtime. This is all about you. Really, really, really important. And then when you're talking about you, you're going to speak about your viability, what you've been doing, the people that are supporting you, and why supporting you is going to get you across the finish line in first place. So those are the things you need to do. All right, so um, our last uh, speaker tonight is um, Matt Sampson. Um, he was recently elected to the Marin Water um, Municipal District in District uh, Division One, um, which stretches in the Galenas Valley and Sleepy Hollow and presses north to Marinwood. Uh, Matt Sampson currently serves as the Deputy Fire Chief for the South San Francisco Fire Department in San Mateo County. He has spent 24 years in emergency services, beginning in Santa Barbara and continuing as a firefighter with the Marin Wood Fire Department and now South San Francisco. He holds a bachelor's degree in, from the University of California, Santa Barbara in geography and is a graduate of the National Fire Academy's Executive Fire Officer Program where he earned the Mono Award for Outstanding Research on Emerging Fire Services Issues. So, Matt, would you like to come up? Thanks to the last speaker, too. That was quite informative. I wish I'd have known that about 12 months ago. Some of that stuff. Was <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it's interesting. And I want to get to your topic about asking for money because I was in those shoes last year. And I, it was a struggle. And then I had an aha moment that hopefully I can share with you that will make it a little bit easier. Um, but one of the things I recommend um, as I was thinking about it today, and this is going just specifically on the fundraising pieces. Right now, if you turn on the radio, it drives me nuts this time of year, but KQED is asking for money. And their ability to tug on heartstrings is unprecedented. And so um, I've actually been able to try to pick up some gems from that. But um, it's very much a pleasure for me to speak tonight. Um, I'm reaching my first year in office here in Marin County, and this group was a really big component to why I was successful in the fall. Um, I was very fortunate enough to earn the support from this group. Um, and while it helped with the voting, uh, what one of the coolest parts was was our daughters got to see that on their um, on their poster, and so they were pretty excited about that. Because my wife is is much more the politician than I am, 
But my story started um, July 14th when I received a phone call while on vacation from someone who I had been speaking with that's involved actually in this group too and in local politics here. And I've been speaking with her for some time about how I can get back involved locally. Like you just heard, I've been in San Mateo County for over two decades. Um, at some point, I'd like to be able to come back into the neighborhood I grew up in and be able to give back um, in some way, shape, or form. And so I tossed around, um, I should have thrown an application in for the San Rafael Fire Commission, but I was told no thanks. And so I kind of backed off for a little while. And then I got this phone call asking if I'd be interested in running for the water board. And my first response was I'd never thought about running for the water board or anything else, <clears throat> but um, can I have some time to think about it? So one week later on July 21st of that same year, last year, um, I met with um, who was vice mayor at the time for San Rafael, Rachel Kurtz, and she um, laid it out there saying, hey, listen, here's the deal. I, I think, um, one, we need a candidate for this office. Two, I think you'd be good. And three, I need an answer pretty quickly. And so I asked her what the pressure was. And she goes, you have two weeks to turn in paperwork to get this thing moving. And so it was this really big freight train coming at me all of a sudden. But it was a really interesting opportunity. Um, but I had really no idea what I was getting myself into. But it was interesting because the water board had always been on my mind. I'd lived in San Rafael since 89, so I got to experience the drought in 91 and thought it was the coolest thing in the world as a kid, learning how to flush a toilet with a bucket of water. Um, <laughs> and then watching parents collect rainwater outside to fill their washing machines. And so those types of memories had always stuck with me. And then it was always, there's always an interesting aspect to, the, to Mount Tam itself, specifically with the um, recreational component of it and the fact that it's a really interesting story that we get 75% of our water from here in the county. You don't really get that same experience in most places throughout California. Um, and then, <clears throat> of course, in just the year prior, uh, there was the big debacle about building a pipeline across the bridge. So there was an interest in the water board to some extent just because it's so prevalent, so in the news, and so important for us. But then as I started thinking about it, I really started putting the pieces together about the wildfire aspect. And so, Looking at the watershed really is, it's a ticking time bomb. Most of this county is really in, 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 in a bad spot for a wildfire severity piece, but the watershed really is in a, a critical spot as well based on the, the lack of um, work that's been done there and, and everywhere really for some time. And so the reason why I'm saying this is because I started thinking about why I'd want to do this. And what was really important from that time period is it allowed me to understand why I was going to run. And when I understood why and I believed in why, it was real easy to start telling my story about that. And so, one, it was allowing me to engage in conversation quickly. Um, but the other part was um, it let people know, one, I was serious and let people know I was running. But it allowed me to give my pitch when I went to ask for money, uh, both the quick elevator pitch but also a, a longer drawn out pitch. So people started understanding, wait a second, this person's actually put some thought into this. This is not some flash in the pan type event. So it started lending credibility right away and it allowed me to get up to speed and, and be able to speak from an educated perspective, again, on the, the same topics. Because as it turns out, the water board was a pretty hot topic for some time here. And there were a lot of people looking for change before this. I didn't know how many people want to be involved in politics. You know, you, it's this entire, can I call it the machine, this two-year machine, and you're already starting to see it percolate right now, and Dick Spotswood's already getting excited about March and starting to write articles about the supervisor rate because I think it's like his fuel for life on some things. Um, <clears throat> but, I mean, it's an interesting perspective, but people want to help. They want to be involved in this. There's so much energy around this, and I, didn't, I hadn't tapped into it at that point because there really wasn't that much of a need. You know, we, we watched the circus that happened a few years before on TV. And uh, uh, anyways, um, understanding that people want to help and there's a lot of people that want to be involved in politics. And before you know it, my next door neighbor comes over and goes, I want to be your sign person. I want to be able to deliver all your signs. You just tell me where, and then once you're good to go, you're good to go. Um, the people down the street say, hey, we want to have a party for you. Someone else says they want to have a party for you. Once people hear that you're running, um, and it's an office for which people care about, um, then they start stepping up and wanting to do things. It's a really interesting piece. So we got the team going. Um, and then one of the things I wish I could have done a little bit earlier on um, is, one, be ready right out of the gate, meaning that as soon as we declared that, I didn't have the website shored, uh, shored up or shored up. 
I didn't have the best way to donate money short of. I didn't have a couple of written things I wish I would have had ready to go. So that when people start to look, because they hear your name, the very first place they go is the internet. And if your site's not up and running, then they go, great, not viable. Or mm, maybe not as confident, uh, you know, as you can see. And even in Spotswood's most recent article about the supervisor race, I mean, he mentions the three candidates and says two have a good looking website and one says they're about to get theirs going. So it's a legitimate thing to get that going. But I would say if you can, timing being key here is, is get that up and running before you put yourself out there. Because once your name's out there, everyone starts Googling like crazy. So um, I wish I had gotten that out there. And then also to understanding that you're gonna have to set boundaries for these people uh, relatively quickly based on your life balance, how you want to um, do things and also expectations. Because um, there's a motivation for the campaign advisor to want to win. Um, there's gonna be a motivation to take, you know, potentially easy ways or give you advice that they think's best and to be able to understand that, no, that's not okay with me or that's crossing the line or doing whatever. And one of those, ones that luckily enough was to catch up on is there was a big request to have campaign pictures with our daughters in there. And that just wasn't something I was comfortable doing. Um, so we went to a compromise. They got to take a picture from the back, <laughs> no faces. But um, things like that to think about that how far do you want to go or what you're willing to be comfortable with because you can get caught up in this heat of the moment thing and there's a sense of urgency. Like if you don't do this, you might not get any votes. And when you take a deep breath and back up, you're like, no, that's, that, we're gonna be okay. This thing's gonna be over in two and a half months and I don't want you know, forever pictures of our daughters on the internet floating around. Not that it's the, the worst place ever, but it just for me, for us, it was important. Um, and so once we got going, I really need, the next big thing for me to understand was what it was gonna take to win. And the very first piece was, was the money piece, identifying it right away. And it freaked me out because I didn't like to ask him for money either. And, and um, I was like, I'm, just, I'm not asking my family, I'm not asking my friends. And that's the first thing I said. And there's only one F left, I guess, at that point. But um, I was pretty clear right off the bat and because I didn't want them to, to have to burden anything that I'm taking on. But what I will say this, and I think I'll talk about the, the, the fundraising piece for a second. Much like people are willing to help, there is an entire, I found an entire group that want to give money and they want to give money because they want to be part of a solution. And if they believe that you're part of the solution, they will help fund that. And so the first few campaign donations I got, I didn't ask for anything. The check just showed up. Awesome. But I started to realize, wait a second, these people want to do this because they want to be involved, because they think that you are going to make the place they live a better place, or what you're going to be able to do for their issue be better. And so um, they want to help you get there. And there's campaign donors know that campaigns are won or lost based on a lot of times based on donations being given and so if people aren't funded then they're not going to be as viable not going to be as viable they're not going to be able to take their message and put it into action and so it became real clear that this is not a this is a transactional thing to the point hey we we believe in you we want you to go win and do what you're saying you're going to do we know this will help and once that perspective changed for me, it was much easier to say, hey, we need a third mailer, or we need 100 more signs to go up, and this is what it's going to cost. And, and those needs started getting met quickly. Um, and then some people just, you know, depending on how you get your donations, we did it through a website as well, but money started randomly coming in. Um, but that was also because there was a pitch there, there was the why there, there was a whole reason behind it, and I tried to get out as much as possible for that. So, um, but uh, oh, back to the thank you notes, I did reach out to everyone who gave and thanked them within 24 hours. I tried to do it with a phone call. They left their phone number just because I want to let them know I appreciate what they're doing and then to be able to respond back saying, hey, you know, you're, this is not just some random campaign donation. We appreciate what you're doing. And when I could, I'd say, we're going to be using this money to do this. And so hopefully that helped create a little bit of a, um, a bond as it could for that. So, um, you know, once, um, once we got the budget out there, I had to understand the district, I had to understand what it was going to take to actually get out and see people sign-wise what we're supposed to be doing and all that stuff. And then I started talking to everyone, anyone who wanted to talk. You know, I can tell you the very first conversation I had with the um, Marine Conservation League group, both sides of every issue out there. And the race I jumped into is very divisive, um, not on the water side, but on the recreational use side. So there's a very um, uh, recognizable um, 
environmental group, and then there's a very recognizable recreational group, and there's not much room in between those two. But I made sure to talk to both of those right off the bat because um, I needed to hear what everyone's concerns were so I can start letting them know where I'm coming from and hopefully either address some of those concerns or <clears throat> potentially look for some sort of compromise um, as best possible. I, I try to go to as many events as possible. Campaign season stuff's everywhere. Even if it's an event that's not even related to the race. I mean, I went to Damon Connolly's birthday. Second time I met Damon Connolly, but happy birthday. You know, but where I'm going with this is... <clears throat> um, there's other, the, the circles that you need to circulate through, the people you need to circulate through are at those events. And a lot of people going to those events are there because they care about politics, they want to be involved, and they want to meet people who are running because they want to stay up to date on the process. And if you're not at all of those remaining relevant throughout this race, <clears throat> then you can fall off to the side. Um, one thing I did want to um, <clears throat> talk about, so I did talk to everybody. One of the mistakes I got caught up in, <clears throat> excuse me, Okay, caught, caught up in was, the, um, was this, the Glazer bill. So I ended up taking money from a group that had a lawsuit pending against the district and ended up, having, <clears throat> excuse me, ended up having to give it back. So please do your homework on that one and just make sure before you take money, do your homework before you take money from people. And if you don't feel comfortable, I recommend giving it back right away. It's a lot cheaper in the long run to be able to do that um, for that. Um, one of, the, one of the big things um, that, that helped out our campaign was the IJ articles. So friends having writing letters to the editor, um, strengthening your case. Oh, thank you very much. And then um, also, too, a Marin voice piece was really big right off the bat because that was a free platform to get our message out. I got more responses on a Marin voice piece in August of the campaign than I did for anything else. So um, very good. Um, in person as much as you can, leverage technology as much as you can, PDI, the app was great, um, but uh, it was great because we got out and used it to walk. We walked and walked and walked and walked and walked. And District 1 is huge for the water district. You know, we ended up having, I think it was like 15 or 16,000 votes for the district, but the amount of homes were, were quite big and, and quite large, but walking was a big deal. Ended up talking to a lot of people. Uh, keep your website current as best as possible. Um, and then, what was the other one? Oh. Balance, 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 balance. If you don't set, uh, set yourself up for a life balance, especially when you're setting yourself up for a calendar, we talked about the budget piece right off the bat when you're running. One of the first things we did was start, we created a calendar for the race, and the first thing we put on there was election day and marched our way back all the way to where we were supposed to be so we understood what we needed to do in incremental ch um, chunks all the way over, and then it allowed me to also to carve out time for the family to stay around for that too. So that, I think that was a recipe for success for us. So we understood where we're going. So with that, sorry, I know we're getting close on time. Um, I didn't bring a dog or anything. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd be more than happy to answer any questions or if you want to talk uh, the fundraising piece, I'd be more than happy to talk more about that as well. Yes? No, Kevin. Well, the other thing is, okay, so um, I've been fortunate. I've been elected to the final board uh, twice. But I didn't have a lot. One of my competitors was a felon. And so um, and he actually got Same with Biden a felony up. for starting a fire. And oh. then he, ran my he ran for the fire board. And my family said, if I can't beat a felon, I can't beat anybody. But, but now it's serious. We are, we are now a district that has contested races. And so mm -hmm. um, I just wondered, what are some, did you run into any brick walls or pitfalls that you can warn me against? I mean, how it's tricky. It's, you know, I'm just concerned about doing a full-fledged campaign. Yeah, so I think um, it, it's easy to stay off. I think it was easy for me to be able to tell people what they wanted to hear or, or, not, or not be myself based on the audience. And I think if I would have gone that route, I would have been tripped up later on. Right. And so I'm staying on message staying on what I believe in and understanding there's some areas I'm not going to agree with everybody, but we can work towards a compromise is much better than I think than telling people what they want to hear Thanks. for them. I have a question as well. When you went to associated parties like David Connolly's birthday party, did you meet viable contacts? Was that important for you? To yeah, it was. And I, and I had a handler the whole time, so full <laughs> disclosure. And so, um, but it, and I, the reason why I say that even jokingly is that if I would have walked in there just by myself, it would be very awkward to try to make 
introductions or just say hi. But I had someone that was already um, with the scene that knew the knew the players at these places, and so I was able to use that and really expedite the process of introductions. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so that that was very helpful. Can you talk to us a little bit about your house parties? If you do have any house yeah. party or fundraising events? We did. We had a few. Um, they were fun, but I say that um, you know, for us, we did a couple, and we tried to make it a little bit neat. We had one at you know a tap room, and then we had a couple of backyards, and they were they were good. Um, and I think it was good to get some one-on-one -on -one time with people. But I, for us, it just wasn't the the main way to raise money. Mm -hmm. But it was. Um, but that was the first time out too, and this was a last minute campaign. I think with some more planning and some more advertising, it could have been a different story. But for me, it just it wasn't the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, did you have volunteers in your campaign who would like do door and on with things like that? We did, and um, we had, what it ended up being was, and I should have mentioned this, but we had um, the, the institutions that we're looking to support, so labor unions or community groups with certain interests, uh -huh. um, a lot of their members would um, don't have the ability to donate um, so, or sniff of money, but they did have time to walk. Right. And so they would walk um, and they would carry a really strong message to, you know, mm -hmm. I work for the water district, I'm a represented employee that I've been there for 20 years, and this is the person that we'd like to lead our organization. Mm -hmm. Was a really, I mean, you can't pay money for that. Mm -hmm. but that's, Right. Yeah. But that's how you got your volunteers was through other through those groups. Yeah. Yes. So, so we you had didn't have, you didn't have to find them yourself. N no, I we had you know I think I think maybe three people, four people that weren't part of yeah. a group that would that would walk every now and then. Great. Yeah. And people want to walk too. That's what blew me away. I, I you know, we had a we had um, there was a, a bike group, and I say bike group, but the, the gentleman and his wife had been involved in politics in Georgia for the past few years, and they moved out here to our district, and she walked, and she was eight and a half months pregnant. <laughs> and another thing, you can't pay enough money for, for that, too. But, but I guess what, what, the reason why I say is that people really, there's, there's a, a whole group of people that they really want to help and feel part of a movement, and it's democracy, right? I mean, you are representing all of that moving forward. Yeah, I know it's a little bit, you know, emotional on a, on a smaller scale, but that's really what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So once you won your race, um, did you do have a party for your volunteers? Do they still follow you? I mean, are you still going to use them or not use them, mm -hmm. but um, have access to them when your campaign comes around again? If so, um, we did do an election night event um, that was welcome for all the volunteers uh, that, that or anyone who helped with the campaign. It's a way to say thank you whether we won or lost. And so um, that, worked, <clears throat> excuse me, that worked out pretty well, but um, everyone still is in contact because everyone who volunteered still wants something. And, and what I mean is they, they have a vested interest in the community. They want to see decisions going certain ways. So now it really is representing the community. So they went from a volunteer role to really representing, the, voicing their, their, their wants.